environmental change were probably commonplace. Dawkins, 1986, Dennett, 1995. Failure to find evidence of intermediate forms of life that evolved and were extinguished in a matter of a few hundred thousand years is not especially surprising. For a species to be identified as a unitary entity some degree of stasis has to be involved, we would not even entertain the idea of a species, whether alive or extinct, unless all of its members shared common attributes over some space of geological time. Whether the emergence of new life forms happens, momentarily, as Gould proposes, largely depends upon one's definition of a moment. The punctuated equilibrium argument depends upon the scale on which one draws evolutionary change. Gould himself appears to recognize this and agrees that, our theory entails no new or violent mechanism, but only represents the proper scaling of ordinary events into the vastness of geological time, Gould, 1992a, p. 12. In this matter, he hardly seems to part company from Darwin himself who wrote, the long periods, during which species have undergone modify cation, though long as measured by years, have been short in comparison with the periods during which they retain the same form, c. Dennett, 1995, p. 290. So, for many evolutionists, Gould's thesis hardly constitutes a major threat to Darwinian ideas. Gould also argues that chance can be an important component of evolution, and again this is far from heretical. It is universally acknowledged that evolution, defined net as a change in the relative frequency of genotypes over time, can be the result of things other than natural or sexual selection, Majerus, Amos, and Hurst. 1996. However, only these latter forces can produce adaptations, by which we mean a feature of design that becomes common by the differential success of phenotypic variants in previous generations. Mutation, migration, and differential mortality due to chance events can all change the gene pool, but not adaptively. Although random catastrophic events may cause the extinction of a whole species, for example, dinosaurs from a meteor strike, they do not cause systematic changes in the gene pool of an existing species. THs is because such events, by their definition and nature, are random. Every year people die as a result of being struck by lightning. The people who die take their genes with them. But the genes that are eliminated are a random selection from the human gene pool. Chance does not systematically retain and reject different variants. Some critics appear to believe that the mere existence of such chance events is a serious challenge to the whole theory. For example, Fausto Sterling offers a hypothetical example of an island of birds, composed of blue and speckled variants, in which the speckled variants are blown onto a neighboring deserted island. She points out that this is an example of evolution by, a chance natural event, not natural selection, Fausto Sterling, 1992, p. 172, but the example is FL odd because the probability of the wind carrying only one color of bird by. Bad science. 35. Chance is vanishingly small. A chance event would be unselective about what color of birds it AF affected. When a natural event went selectively AFFECTS one variant speckled birds while not AF affecting the other blue birds then it is most likely for a reason, perhaps the speckled birds weighed less than the blue ones. TH has made them more likely to be blown away and would constitute a clear case of natural selection. To give another example, imagine a community of people who vary genetically in their tendency to store fat. A famine occurs and those with low fat reserves perish before the rains come. Th. E genes for low fat reserves will be selectively culled. Although the famine was a chance event, its FECT was systematic selection. Chance events that do not distinguish their targets can have evolutionary FECTS, notably the extinction of whole communities and species, but only chance events that have systematic FECTS on different variants can generate adaptations. Gould and Lewontin, 1979, coined the term, spandrel, to describe epiphenomenal aspects of natural selection. They borrowed the term from architecture. In cathedrals, notably the Basilica di San Marco in Venice, spandrels are ornately decorated and give the appearance of having been put there specify Cali for this aesthetic purpose. But as Gould and Lewontin note, they are simply a byproduct of the design, they had to exist as soon as the architect decided to join two rounded arches at right angles and thereby created a tapered triangular space. Gold's point was that we must not assume everything in nature to be a functional adaptation. Some apparent design features are merely side FECTS of selection for something quite different. Bones are white and we might be tempted to pose the question, what is the evolutionary advantage of the whiteness of bones? If it were not for the fact that bones just happen to be made out of calcium which happens to be white in color. 
Blue or purple bones could do the job just as well and the color is of no evolutionary significance although bones themselves are. Because most genes are pleiotropic they have multiple FECTS, some natural phenomena are simply side FECTS that have survived because they tagged on to an adaptive gene complex and were not so detrimental as to outweigh the beneficial impact of the other phenotypic FECTS. As Dennett notes, daisies FLO'd in water but no sensible person would ask what the adaptive significance of their buoyancy is. The thesis that every property of every feature of everything in the living world is an adaptation is not a thesis anybody has ever taken seriously, or implied by what anybody has taken seriously, so far as I know. If I am wrong, there are some serious loonies out there, but Gould has never shown us one. Dennett, 1995, p. 276. Gould, 1991, has also introduced another term, the exaptation, to describe, any organ not evolved under natural selection for its current use, either because it performed a different function in ancestors' classical preadaptation or 36. The Essential Woman, BIOPHOBIA and the Study of Sex Differences. Because it represented a non-functional part available for later co-optation, his example is bird feathers which originally evolved to conserve heat but were later exapted for use in F.L. Yang. Th's example highlights the co-option of a functional feature from one role to another but his definition also includes the co-option of spandrels non-functional features. In one sense it is misleading to coin a new term for this process because all current adaptations arose from previous states of the organism and genetic mutation can only use available components to engineer change whether they were functional in some other realm or not. In birds, feathers happen to be available and, along with a host of other mutational changes, were exploited for flat ying purposes. But Gold's writing has had the FECT of generating confusion about the agency that is responsible for co-option. In places, he implies that natural selection does the work, while in others he seems to suggest that it is the human mind. If he means the former then there is nothing very new being added to the concept of adaptation. But if he means the latter, then we are talking about a different process. Reading and writing are human abilities that are too recent to have evolved by natural selection and may well represent exaptations of existing human abilities language, symbolic communication, manual dexterity, representational thought. The human ability to creatively exploit our mental and physical capacities in new ways deserves study in its own right but cannot yet be examined in terms of natural selection. The we have it. The pace of evolution, the role of chance, and the status of spandrels and exaptations constitute the full extent of the raging disagreements in evolutionary thought. Let us now turn to the extent of unanimity in feminist theory. Th how the term is widely used, it is hard to pin down a definition. Th e nearest I have been able to find is this. Feminist theorists are concerned with how gender, which is the social construction of characteristics associated with sex AFFECTS individuals' access to control of their own and other people's lives, power, and resources, Gowati, 1992, p. 218, th. Is certainly defying ES the subject matter of the discipline, but where is the theory? Theories are usually taken to be higher level explanations from which local hypotheses can be drawn, but explanation is absent from this definition. Even a more direct statement of feminist theory such as, the belief that women have been oppressed by men, is essentially a statement of historical fact rather than an explanation. The absence of agreement about just what constitutes feminist theory is perhaps not surprising when its own proponents acknowledge that, THR seem to be many kinds and varieties of feminism, as many kinds and varieties as there are individual feminists with individual desires, notions and conceptions of what we are and want, Gowati. 1992, p. 225, indeed, we are chastised for expecting consensus, individuals. Bad science. 37. Unfamiliar with feminism or women's studies often assume that feminist theory provides a singular and unified framework for analysis, Rosser, 1997, p. 22. At least nine brands of feminist theory have been identified, Percy, 1998, Rosser, 1997. Liberal feminists argue for the advantages of psychological androgyny, the establishment of a gender-blind society with equal opportunities for men and women, and are unique among feminists in continuing to accept traditional scientific method. Marxist feminists argue that gender oppression can be traced to capitalism and to the power structures reproduced by class in capitalist societies. Socialist feminists integrate material, 
social, and unconscious processes in explaining how race, gender, class, and sexuality produce power relations that disadvantage women. Afro-American feminists reject the Eurocentric approach to knowledge embodied in individualism and positivism. THEY maintain that race is the primary oppression and that gender is secondary to this. Radical feminists believe that men's oppression of women is the most fundamental and widespread oppression in society. THEY urge women to reject all theories developed by men including Marxism, psychoanalysis, positivism, and existentialism. Women can gain true knowledge only by using and reflecting on their own personal experiences and those of other women. Essentialist feminists argue that women by virtue of their biological and psychological qualities are equal or superior to men. Originally rejecting biological differences as a tool for conservatives who wished to keep women in the home, they have now rethought their position, with a recognition that biologically based differences between the sexes might imply superiority and power for women in some areas, Rosser, 1997, p. 29. Psychoanalytic feminists use neo-Freudian theory to argue for the unconscious internalization of female powerlessness. THEY trace male dominance to the fact that women are the chief caretakers of infants and children, resulting in boys distancing themselves from their mother and adopting independent and autonomous styles while girls become enmeshed in overdependent relationships with their mothers. Existential feminists emphasize the ways in which women are raised to see maleness as the natural human state in which women are the objectified other. Postmodern feminists reject the notion of a stable and unified self. THEY also reject the idea that women can speak with a unified voice. THEY reject grand theoretical narratives and argue that gender, like the self, is neither real nor phi XED but variously socially constructed in different contexts. I thought this was a comprehensive list but three more brands of feminism have appeared, see Maidment, 2006, and the more discriminating take the total number of feminisms to 20, de Kieserty, 2011. However, I am sure you get the general idea. Intradisciplinary diversity on this scale leaves plenty of room to chastise outsiders as naive and uninformed, and to hide from critics, it is though erroneous to view feminism as a monolithic. 38. The Essential Woman BIOPHOBIA and the Study of Sex Differences Enterprise, which is frequently done in attacks on feminist research and theories, de Kieserty, 2011, p. 298. In most of the examples given, it is clear that the political agenda of feminism or a putative description of the status quo has superseded, theory, as it is normally understood. It is a surprise to many evolutionary psychologists to find themselves accused of internal wrangling when faced with the bewildering disarray of feminist theory. Time for reconciliation. A featuring er the FL Uri of attacks and rebuttals that greeted the arrival of evolutionary psychology, things have quieted down considerably in the new millennium. Feminists and liberal social scientists have begun to recognize that biology need not be equated with destiny or determinism. Vandermassen, 2005, and feminist journals have hosted special issues on evolution, e.g., Eagley and Wood, 2011. Evolutionists have widened their horizons to encompass higher order cognition and cultural evolution. THEY have increasingly engaged with the origins of con FLICT between the sexes Borgerhoff Mulder and Roch, 2009. THE theoretical debate is more measured now. Less raucous and acerbic, it takes place in the most prestigious academic journals, e.g., Archer, 2009, Eagley and Wood, 2009. Indeed, the invention of a new term, evolutionist feminist, might seem to signal a truce liaison, 2007. Surely it finally dispels the artificial gulf between support for feminist political goals, equal opportunities for all irrespective of their sex, and acceptance of Darwinian theory that humans evolved through a process of natural and sexual selection. Yet, things are not quite that simple. The olive branch of rapprochement is not held out to all Darwinians. Over the past 25 years, evolutionary approaches and feminism itself have complemented each other, offering insights into female behavior and the relationships between the sexes. In fact, those subfields that have roots in sociobiology, evolutionary biology, behavioral ecology, primatology, and evolutionary anthropology, have built strong bridges with feminism, and feminist insights have also been well received within these fields. Leeson, 2007, p. 62. Notice Leeson's conspicuous omission of evolutionary psychology, and this is not a mere oversight. Why?
because the disciplines that are acceptable to feminism are interested in behavioral outcomes, whereas evolutionary psychologists are more interested in the psychological processes that lead to reproductive decisions, Leeson, 2007, p. 62, th. Is rather enigmatic explanation of evolutionary psychology's exclusion, shouldn't psychologists be interested in psychological processes? Is based on the argument that evolved psychological modules remove FLX ability from human behavior. TH is as why Leeson endorses a convenient silence on the question of how the human mind makes decisions. Unlike evolutionary psychologists, behavioral ecologists are not. Three questions 39. Concerned with the actual mechanisms, genes are psychological mechanisms that lead individuals to their adaptive solutions. Leeson, 2007, p. 63. By ignoring proximate mechanisms, behavioral ecologists cannot be accused of determinism because they do not take a position on how genetic and psychological processes produce optimal behavioral choices. THIR's silence on the determinism issue makes them more acceptable to feminists. Oddly, while evolutionary psychologists are accused of ignoring human plasticity, Leeson, 2007, page 55, they are simultaneously credited with believing that humans have evolved underlying psychological mechanisms that are sensitive to the environment, interactions with others, and what we know about ourselves, pp. 54 to 55. Here she is quite correct. Evolved modules are responsive to specify C environmental inputs and depend upon them for their normal development and their functionality. The life history strategy pursued by an individual is shaped by her circumstances. High rates of local mortality and family disruption signal an uncertain future and, in response, individuals move to a faster life tempo with less secure emotional attachments, more intense competition and earlier reproduction. Belsky, Steinberg, Houts and Halpern Felscher, 2010. Chisholm, Quinlevin, Peterson, and Cole, 2005, Wilson and Daly, 1997. The local ecology also modulates mate preferences. Where the chief dangers to offspring survival are famine and drought, women prefer long-term relationships with high-investing men. Where the chief risk is disease, women select men on the basis of their genetic quality because children's survival depends most strongly on their inherited ability to fight GHT pathogens Gangestad and Simpson, 2000. But putting aside the specify CS and accuracy of these feminist criticisms, it is useful to remember Robert Benchley's pithy remark, THR are two kinds of people in the world, those who divide the world into two kinds of people and those who don't. Feminists seem to specialize in dividing people up, 20 kinds of feminism. And now 5A types of, evolutionist feminist. Others see such an activity as divisive and counterproductive. The disciplinary nameplate on a departmental door is considerably less important than the quality of thought and research that goes on behind it. THR is plenty of room for everyone in our attempt to understand the behavior of men and women, from those working at the level of population statistics to those examining cellular responses to hormones. But it is not reasonable for feminists to demand that psychologists ignore the human mind for fear of phi nding something politically. Uncongenial in there. Three questions. Are there inequities between women and men in society? Where did they come from? How shall we change them? 40. The essential woman. B-I-O-P-H-O-B-I-A and the study of sex differences. The FIRST question is a straightforward empirical one that we can answer with respect to a variety of criteria including relative income, likelihood of promotion, leisure time, voting rights, participation in political life, public recognition of achievement, and so on, while holding all other variables apart from sex constant. Most people would agree that such differences do exist and in the main women fare less well than men. The's second question is the subject matter of this book. I will map some of the domains of women's lives that are characteristically different from men's and offer an interpretation of them from the viewpoint of evolutionary theory. I will be addressing the distal causes of male-female difference stemming from disparate pressures on men and women over several hundred thousand years. But these evolved differences can also set up a dynamic of their own. If fewer men than women excel in the phi eld of interpersonal sensitivity and if fewer women than men excel at spatial navigation, we can be misled into categorizing these activities as male or female. But the differences between men and women are differences of degree not kind. The overlap on the statistical distribution is great. Even in the most male advantaged tasks running a marathon or weightlifting, there are always some women who do better than the less able men and vice versa. 
th is even more true of most psychological characteristics. We must avoid restricting opportunities on the basis of crude stereotypes about what men and women are able to do. My concern with stereotypes is not so much that they drive people to conformity, I have already explained that stereotypes are more likely the product rather than the cause of sex differences, but that they may cause us to debar entry on the basis of sex. For example, denying women the opportunity to be phi re phi ghters or police officers is rationalized on the grounds of women's lesser strength or endurance. But this is clearly wrong. The criteria should not be sex but the individual's actual ability to perform the tasks that the job entails. Capable women should be given entry not in the belief that they will act as role models to other women but because to deny them the right to take up a job for which they are qualified is a basic human injustice. Whether or not we want to alter the status quo is not a matter for psychologists, but for society at large. Th. The last half century has shown that there is a public will to do so. But social engineering without a firm scientify C understanding of sex differences is like a surgeon operating with a blindfold to be in Cosmides, 1992. In promulgating the belief that gender is socially constructed and is without any psychological basis, we are already in danger of developing policies that are not in women's best interests. We are told that women's nature can and should be the same as men's. Psychosexual neutrality is applauded. We are told that there is nothing special or privileged about the bond between a mother and her infant. As a result, single mothers have been financially coerced into. 3 Questions 41. Putting their children into daycare and returning to work. Employed mothers' feelings of loss and guilt are concealed because they are incompatible with effective performance in the workplace. Purdy, 1999. Women employees who do not show the ruthless drive of their male counterparts are disparaged as poor role models and blamed for their sex's failure to break through the glass ceiling. Girls who resist the contemporary educational pressure to take science subjects are viewed as academic also rans. But if we were to accept that women and men are different, we can think about a society that breaks down the barriers between children and work, that does not force women into competition with one another, and that allows women to capitalize on their natural advantages. If evolutionary theory is correct, we cannot design 25 RST century women from scratch. Ideology, social policy, law, and the media cannot make women into something they are not. What governments can and should do is to give people choices that allow them the maximum freedom to be whoever they want. With that freedom, women's nature can take its own course. Chapter 2. Mothers Matter Most. Women and Parental Investment. Ask a child why mothers matter and there will be no shortage of answers. They make costumes for the school play, they organize birthday parties, they look after you when you have chicken pox, they do the school run, they make up the beds so friends can stay overnight, they take you to kids' movies that bore most grown-ups, and so on. Fathers do not lack the competence to do these things yet they do them less often. For many social scientists the reasons are to be sought in patriarchy, constricted gender roles, and maternal guilt. But evolutionary theorists step further back to look at the biological basis of reproduction because that is the wellspring from which these other more proximate social and psychological causes spring. Sexual, not natural selection. When we think of evolution we tend to think of natural selection, the competition for survival. But Darwin knew that there was more to the process of evolution than this. Survival without reproduction is a genetic dead end. An animal that survives but does not reproduce leaves no genes behind. Our forebears may not necessarily have lived a long life, but we know that they successfully reproduced and ensured that their progeny reached reproductive age. Darwin 1871 named this second strand of evolution sexual selection, the advantage which certain individuals have over others of the same sex and species, solely in respect of reproduction. So the prize is not necessarily to survive to an old age but to reproduce. After reproduction, natural selection is indifferent to us, even callous. Genes that enhance youthful reproduction will FL hourish even if, as a side FECT, they happen to cause earlier death. Cancer and heart disease are immune from natural selection, as long as they do not kill people too early in life. Death is the result of an absence of selection pressure on the diseases of old age because our death is of no consequence in the grand scheme of things. Sex differences derive from sexual rather than natural selection. If women were more vulnerable to death, if they made easier prey or succumbed more quickly to the FECTS of sexual, not natural selection 43. Food shortage, women and the whole species with them would have become extinct. 
In fact, if we look at average age of death, women survive longer than men. If there is an imbalance it seems to work against men rather than women. For every 100 girls born, about 105 baby boys arrive. Because males take more risks, are more vulnerable to violence, accidents, and suicide, and experience more developmental difficulties such as attention defy CIT hyperactivity disorder, autism, and conduct disorder, we need to begin with a surplus of males in order to end up at maturity with an equal representation of both sexes. Inclusive Phi TNESS is the sum total of the genes that we leave behind in all of our blood relatives including children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. TH's number is probabilistically related to our own personal reproductive success. THE more children we have, the more grandchildren we are likely to have. Each child will carry one half of our genes and each grandchild one quarter. Any genetic trait that has the FECT of increasing the number of children that we rear will be expressed in more future bodies than a genetic trait that puts us at a disadvantage in reproductive competition. But the traits that assist men and women in carrying their genes forward are not identical. A good strategy for a man may be counterproductive for a woman. Over evolutionary time, we begin to see a sex difference appear. Baby girls receive those genes that selectively help females to become reproductively successful, while baby boys receive a slightly different complement of genes that in the past have helped their fathers and grandfathers. TH are a number of ways in which these genetic sex differences can be carried between generations. Some traits may be sex limited. Here the genes are carried on autosomal chromosomes, ones that do not code for anatomical sex differences, and are only activated in the presence of sex specify C hormones such as testosterone. Or they may be sex-linked, carried on the X or Y chromosome that determines the child's sex. An added wrinkle to this pathway is the increasing number of genomically imprinted traits that are being found. In this process, whether or not a gene is expressed depends upon which parent donated the gene. For example, recent work suggests that girls' greater social intelligence is mediated by genes received from their father not from their mother. THEX chromosome that the father contributes carries the critical genes. THE homologous genes on the X chromosome that the mother contributes are silenced. THs may explain why boys, who receive only the mother's copy of the X chromosome, are more vulnerable to disorders of social cognition and language, such as autism, SCUS, 2000, SCUS et al. 1997. Studies of rodents suggest that a similar process may operate for maternal behavior, the mother's tendency to retrieve straying pups and return them to the nest is mediated by the X chromosome of her own father. 44. Mothers matter most. Women and parental investment. Whatever the pathway used, each sex receives the genetic instructions most useful for building a mind that will enhance the body's reproductive success. So sex differences are expected only where they have a direct INFL UNS on sex specify C reproductive strategy. Biology can point to the sexual strategies of men and women that lie behind evolved psychological differences. Anisogamy, the start of parental inequity. Sexual reproduction is not obligatory in nature. TH are plenty of ways to reproduce that do not require the fusion of gametes from two individuals. In parthenogenetic species, no mating is needed. North American whiptail lizards are all female and, in the breeding season, they produce about 10 unfertilized eggs that hatch carrying 100% of their mother's DNA. Fisher, 1993. TH air are plenty of advantages to this strategy, these females do not waste time and energy on phi nding mates, they do not expose themselves to predators while copulating, they do not have to compete with others to impress the opposite sex with their desirability, and most importantly they do not dilute their genetic legacy by 50%. But it is this last factor that paradoxically becomes an advantage in mating. Sexual reproduction creates novel and unique individuals and this has a threefold implication. First, because offspring differ from their parents and their siblings, they can occupy a variety of different environmental niches and so create less competition with their kin, while increasing the odds that at least some will survive in the face of unpredictable local hazards such as sudden climatic changes. Second, each offspring's unique genotype means that it has a unique immune system, when parasites take hold they may prove deadly to some of the brood but others will survive. Another advantage of sexual reproduction is genetic repair. A strand of DNA is composed of sequences of the four nucleotides C, G, T, and A. When an error occurs, C, G, the best way to find out what should really be there instead of the, is to examine the second copy of the sequence on the complementary strand of DNA. 
but it will do no good if the second strand has come from the same genetic line as the FIRST because there is a good chance that it will carry the same error. In sexual reproduction, the enzymatic, proofreading, machinery of the cell consults the 